Well, salam alaikum and uh, welcome in Egypt. So, I came back in May from a five-year living experience in Egypt, working with the utility, the, the Egyptian holding company for water and wastewater, and kind of working with them on how we could scale up small-scale sanitation for uh, the small settlements in the Nile Delta, and with a longer perspective to care also the small scale settlements in, uh, in the whole country. So what we will hear today are actually our conclusions from this five year experience and also a bit now what is the visions or the recommendations we are discussing with the utility on the scale up of small scale sanitation systems in a disabling institutional and regulatory environment because as you would, as you will say, that's the main button next right now. So to set up the, the scene, this is a typical small settlement in the Nile Delta. So as you can see, even if we are in a small settlement, it has quite an urban uh, fascias because of the very, very high density of such settlements. We also have a lot of fecal starch management. And basically, the Nile Delta or Egypt as a whole, as you know, it's like the Nile Valley plus the Delta mainly. It's just a network of drains and canals with, of course, this link to irrigation and agriculture. Hence, the very important need to treat the wastewater because wastewater in Egypt is recycled at least twice between the time it reaches the country from Sudan until it reaches the Mediterranean Sea. So, basically, we are talking about when 85% of the rural areas in Egypt are without wastewater treatment. So this means about 4,700 villages, and village in Egypt means up to 50,000 inhabitants, and about 30,000 scattered settlements. So this is more like the scale we're talking about, these 30,000 scattered settlements. And the main goal of our ESRIS project was the development of a wide-scale replicable model for the small-scale sanitation in the Nile Delta with the small scale defined in this project as less than 5,000 capita, be it settlements or small cluster of settlements, focus on cost effectiveness, on how to improve cost effectiveness, and of course the context appropriateness of the solutions we have been devising. So basically in this project we had three main components. The first one was to, to understand actually what was done in the past, what were the past initiatives in small scale sanitation in Egypt, why they failed, why they succeeded, what were the factors. Secondly, it was to develop a data baseline and a model based planning tool to estimate wastewater characteristics because we found out pretty quickly that actually there was very little literature about this topic in Egypt and actually very little understanding of what we were talking about. People used to design rural infrastructure based on codes of practice that were urban, basically. And finally, we had a big work about policy recommendations at the highest level in the state. Just to talk a little bit about how we did this assessment, well, the airbag, we always have this uh, enabling environment framework, which is a kind of a way to structure a little bit the factors that are influencing the success or not of a project or program and basically it is composed of six components which is the government support, the legal and regu regulatory framework, the institutional arrangements that you have around your project, the skills and capacities that are available, the financial arrangements and the social cultural acceptance of the project. If you want to like to have an, an example like of a detailed analysis then, I mean, I did it like for, for Egypt, really like an exhaustive analysis according to these six uh, uh, components, and you will see that actually it can be replicated to many countries we are working in. Based on that, we did like a research or policy uh, brief uh, addressed to the holding company, and I would say here it was very clear that the critical issue in Egypt was institutional and managerial, but not technical. Because as a matter of fact, with all the money, the development money that we have in Egypt, 
with all the past initiatives, we have a big patchwork and mosaic of all possible technologies that you can find. So everything is there, but in the end, nothing has functioned in the long run, and we are still without a model that can be replicated on a large scale. So what is exactly a disabling institutional environment? Well, first of all, it is, means that there is no clear responsibility for rural sanitation and there is a lack of vision at governmental level. Secondly, there is no constructive collaboration between the utility, the Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation, and as you can imagine in such a rural area, the link between sanitation and irrigation is really crucial, and the Ministry of Health that is setting the standards. Then, we also observe that after all these kind of painful initiatives from different donors and, in, and institutions, that there is a kind of lack of faith in small-scale systems in the utility. Next to that, there is a lack of experience about small-scale sanitation, both in the utility but also in the local private sector, so consultants and contractors. There is a tradition of, of overstaffing with underskilled people, which is also like a big barrier for the scaling up of small-scale sanitation. And there is a reluctance to increase the fees and weak fee recovery. So basically, if you don't manage to, uh, to operate uh, with success your large-scale treatment plants, there is actually little chance that we'll manage your small-scale treatment plants if you don't have a different way of doing things. Now, what is a disabling regulatory environment? So basically, well, this we already like discussed uh, in, the, in detail yesterday. Like the efferent standards are not adapted for rural sanitation, so they are too stringent. We can say it's an all or nothing philosophy, and unfortunately, when it's impossible to read the standards, people just do nothing because doing nothing is tolerated, whereas failing with a treatment plant is not, especially if it is not a governmental one. And we can see that in particular the COD and this of oxygen pathogen standards are the major issue. And basically an issue in, that, in such context is that there is no link with the quality of receiving water bodies. So basically you have to treat your wastewater to a high standard to dump it in a drain which quality, whose quality is close to wastewater. So, just to give you short examples from the region, so like COD in Egypt is like 80 the standards compared to the European Union for small communities, which is 125. And as you can see, Morocco and Jordan have much more progressive or pragmatic approach when it comes to these kind of rural areas. Next to that, another problem on the regulatory uh, level is that there is no regulation protecting the community and the private sector for the management of all or part of the sanction system. So basically, when it comes to the government, failure is permitted, but if it comes to a private manager, then it can be brought to the court and then really like a, a big bad face, let's say, from the governmental side. So basically, in the end, like, no communities want to engage in such small-scale projects. The planning and design standards are currently uh, hindering factors and basically we can see that the systems we've been talking about or the system that they compose the DWAT system are actually still not in the code of practice and basically contractors and consultants are always backed by the code of practice so even if you know that what you do is wrong if you do it according to the code of practice you are right but if you do something that you think is right but actually fails to meet the standards and it is not in the code of practice, then you're in big trouble. So it's very important as a first step to work on the code of practice and fortunately enough it is a process that has been done in the last couple of years in Egypt. So very soon we'll have all those systems in the national code of practice. And uh, more specific examples here is also like that we would need the pragmatic use of small drains uh, that should be approved by the Ministry of Irrigation because, as we all know, anaerobic treatment is cheap and kind of compact, but the problem is more on the polishing side, especially when it comes to, to meet high standards. And here, I mean, there are a lot of synergies with uh, irrigation and agriculture in such a context like the Nile Delta, as uh, shown on this 
illustration and you, you could easily see like points in series in such a setup. So now going to policy from this uh, disabling factors, right, the first key message in Egypt is that really we don't need more pilots. I mean, we have enough pilots, we have pilots of all kinds that we need to go uh, further. And here the general saying is that pilots never fail, pilots never scale. And I think there are two main reasons for that. I mean, the, the first one is that they remained mostly uh, isolated. And the second reason is that doing a pilot is like, you know, it's like your own baby. So agencies tend to over invest on a pilot to make sure that it's perfect, that it works well. But this very big extra effort that people put into pilots per se make the pilot unreplicable. And this is a, a big issue. So the main recommendation that we have is really like to think at scale from the start, at least uh, in Egypt, and that pilots need to be realized at scale if we talk about pilots. So here what is needed now in Egypt is to pilot management schemes with a critical mass of projects and centralized management. And here it really echoes what our colleague uh, Banachan had told us yesterday, like we, we, we have again this idea of the critical mass and working on the program approach rather than project approach or really on the large scale. And what we should pilot are actually not small technical pilot, but really pilot economies of scale, both at implementation and management level. I will come back to that later. And to focus on increased cost effectiveness. So different ways forward is actually we should start thinking from the supply side and the business perspective. So how, like, how, how, sh how will it look like if we scale up, if we have like 100 of villages to serve at the same time? And here when talking about these economies of scale, of course, we can think about the standardization of the units, but also the standardization of the management. And we have to show the potential for the private sector in terms of job creation and also, I mean, to, to the government, especially like in Egypt now where as you know, like the, the problems of job was actually uh, one of the main reasons for the, the Arab Spring. And we have to show so that small scale sanitation is just, is just not a fantasy, but it's also a new market for uh, the local private sectors. However, as we saw that there is no, the local no is not there, we have to kind of focus on the know-how transfer, especially when it comes to prefabricated uh, units and to capacity building because it is clear that in Egypt the know-how will not come from inside. Somehow we need to, to make partnerships. And we have to advocate for awareness at the top level of the state. So somehow, and this also comes back to what was suggested, that trying to reform regulations one by one will not work in Egypt. So we really need to have a like totally different approach that can lead to a decision from the top that can lead to a quick change. And here, of course, we are dealing with a kind of a dictatorship. So as you know, if the decision comes from President Al-Sisi, then it will very quickly trickle down to all levels. So something that has been already like widely done by Borda is really to explore this concept of locally produced prefabricated units. And of course, in Egypt, I mean, we have a very good industrial ground for that. And the benefits, of course, are the, that the quality is under control and quality was a big issue in the past initiatives because the local contractors did not know how to build this kind of systems. We don't have the price negotiation every time, so we also avoid a lot of problems with corruption, with the cost under control, we save a lot of time in the construction process, we open the promising market, and at the same time we also reach this modularity and flexibility we've been already talking about. So, by talking about prefabricated units, it's always, it always comes to the issue of how to involve the private sector, practically. So if we look at the private sector currently, actually we see that the private sector seems to be playing against small-scale sanitation. So there is a high resistance to innovation, there is a lack of know in that field, huge overheads to cover the risk of doing something new, poor construction quality and very long implementation time. 
So the recommendations there would be like first to encourage design, build, operate mechanisms, which is like also basically to increase accountability. Investigate potential business models and show really like the utility, how a sustainable business model would look like to encourage local prefabrication and also to train local engineers and masons at the government le level. And here, I mean, it also like echoes a bit what we heard about the importance of training local engineers and masons to, uh, to build these kind of small scale systems. Otherwise, we'll always run into contractors that are not able to do it correctly. So the role of the institutions here, I mean, how to encourage this private sector and get it right. Here I don't have like the magic bullet, but we have to think in terms of licensing in, to, to, to make sure that we have the right persons doing what we want to do, that it's not like an uncontrolled sector. Certification, fostering joint ventures with international companies, and also like which mechanism to guarantee the cost recovery for private stakeholders that will enter this market. Because of course like the fee collection and village level is a big issue. So we, we need a mechanism to ensure that somebody would pay for this private stakeholder to do the job right. And the question is, uh, is would this be the role of a centralized management unit or a specific department with a utility? I mean, always like where to embed such a management institution? I mean, this is a question that is still open in the Egyptian sector. So basically, here, and you see it, all those factors actually, they, they all go in, also in the direction of increasing increase the cost effectiveness. And we also talked about modularity and phase implementation to reduce the idle capacity, limit the planning horizon. So all factors that really kind of lower the cost of small scale systems because until now, many people would say, look, it costs much more to build hundred small treatment plants rather than a few big centralized treatment plants, which is of course not really just a matter of how you calculate, but still the kind of a mainstream thinking in Egypt. And of course, it's very important to determine the management and financial arrangements before the final technology selection, which was a big failure factor in the past small scale initiative in the country. So talking about management schemes, well, we already said that isolated technology will fail, but at the same time, like human resources required is a concern for the institutions, and that's the link with this overstaffing, with underskilled people. They say, look, if we have 100 small-scale treatment plants, and we have to put, as usual, like four people looking after the small-scale sanitation systems, imagine how many human resources we would need to cover the country. And then that's where we say, no, actually, with these small-scale systems, they run mainly by themselves, so you don't need to have guys like all the time sitting there and looking at the, your uh, anaerobic reactor, but rather we should look at centralized management of these decentralized systems. And basically what we need, we need a dedicated structure. We already talked about where to embed this structure with just a few professionals that are specifically trained in order to concentrate the skills. I think this skill concentration is really important not only for the quality of the people, but also to be able to keep the people in their place. Because so far, people that don't have incentives, they tend to move all the time and you train somebody and then one year later he's in Saudi Arabia uh, doing something else. And at the same time, it's also very important to delegate partially to the communities. So, to synthesize, what is needed is really like this trial of this large-scale management scheme. And so far, it has not happened, but that's what we are advocating for. And this uh, centralized unit should be like an interface between the institution, the private sector, and the community. So like, which is a position that is currently lacking. And here again, there are three main answers, uh, questions to be answered. Mainly like, well, how to start? What should be the status of such a unit in the institutions and where it should be embedded, and what is the setup that would best encourage the private sector. And here I think we have like two different approaches, like either we start as um, at a small regional level, so like what we call like a niche management, somehow like small in the region and then 
see how we can upscale in different regions in the country, or to start at policy level and then try to trickle down. So this is to the scale of these centralized management units. Shall it be one for hundred? Shall it be one first at national level? Well, this is still open, open to debate, and of course only the local politicians can can answer. Now, to come back a little bit to different factors of you know, how to convince people in such a disabling environment, well, we need to increase the credibility of small-scale systems in order to lower the risk of failure. And a big bottleneck actually was seen also in how these projects were planned. So, basically there is a need to provide local consulted consultants with tools which will help them to get re relevant assessment of the initial situation because very often it's like very poor quality reports and then blueprints that, are, that actually don't really match the local realities good data analysis and the estimation of design parameters on a context specific basis so basically it's very important here to understand better the quantity and characteristics of the wastewater to treat with village specific design criteria. So this is something that is very different to urban context. In the Nile Delta, we see actually very uh, big differences from one village to the other, and per se, it's a big factor for wasting money with under design or over design infrastructure. So to sum up, it's important to facilitate the local utility and consultants to take up small-scale sanitation with a minimal risk. And I think this is one of the big roles we have as external agencies because things will never go uh, by themselves with something that, that is actually new uh, for the country. So this is a bit like the range, just to show you like in Egyptian villages, the BOD can go like in average from 200 to 1,000 and the COD from 400 to 2,500. So you can see a little bit the range that you can find from one village to the other and that, that justifies a little bit uh, the provision of tools for these consultants so that they can actually assess a small village quickly with the minimal amount of relevant data. And quickly it means like in three days. So that's why one of the big part of our project is also to develop this tool to help them do that quickly in a very uh, structured way. I will not go into the details, uh, but basically it's about providing simple interview guidelines to get the relevant uh, general data, like simplified household survey questionnaires to get more like household level data. And finally, like to provide an interface where this data can be uh, uh, entered and then compared, cross-checked, because basically we always have data from different sources. And what a big problem is actually that people don't really come to analyze their data and cross-check the data. So like the tool is doing it for you, and then it gives you an estimation of your design parameters for a specific village with a certain certain range. So talking about BOD, COD, of course we come back to the to the standards. And as I said before, in Egypt we have a everything or nothing philosophy. And here, as we discussed yesterday, also say that for 20 years they already started to change the standards. And actually, you have the utility which tries to lower the standards, but you have the Ministry of Health who tries to put even more stringent standards. So actually it's there is no space to change the standards, but there is definitely space to try to get an incremental implementation of the standards or to get like a moratorium on the standards for the uh, rural areas. And I think a solution is possible with clear responsibilities. The problem is that in a place that is driven mainly by a lot of bad faith actually is that nobody wants to take the move to put pragmatic standards because later on they would be accused for the whole pollution of the country. People don't have you know, this kind of memory, like, now the drains are really in dreadful conditions, but if somebody, like the Ministry of Irrigation lowered the standards in three years, people would say, look, the drains are really in these dreadful conditions because we just changed the standards. Which means that it, it needs to be a national responsibility that is shared among the different institutions. 
Now, of course, the communities are also uh, quite important. And I will not go here in the details, but what we can say that actually in those kind of setups, we always say that money is a problem, but actually the communities are already paying much more money than in urban areas and much more money than they should even compare to the national tariff. So the good news here is that actually there is a capacity to pay, but we need to improve the cost recovery. We need to allow a process, that, I mean, we need to allow that they pay more than in urban areas. And at the same time, to encourage them paying, we need to think about bundling several services together to kind of justify the increased uh, fee collection. And finally, regarding the communities, another different factor is that many of them they actually have money aside to build sewer networks. They are already like building sewer networks, actually usually body design. So here, as a first step, to, it could be very like a, a cheap action to just help them doing their sewer system right with the money they already <coughs> collected. So to conclude this kind of exhaustive talk, I would just want like to, to come back to the, the main factors. So first of all, really think at scale. Then thinking about this critical mass and thinking about the centralized management of decentralized units, try to pilot economies of scales, both at implementation and management level. <laughs> try to convince the government through the business potential, so show them the interest of dealing at a large scale, interest for job creation, interest for uh, encouragement of local industry, sometimes for their own interest because, of course, politicians are also economic, stakeho uh, economic stakeholders or the army is also like the main economic stakeholder. Facilitate the work of consultant and contractors. Get this incremental implementation of the standards and as the overall create new drivers of change. On these words I say shukran and if you have any interest of our project you can refer to the website uh, on the bottom of the page. Thank you very much. Um, I was very interested in um, this tool you were presenting about uh, how to estimate the per capita design loads. And this, as you know this is a great um, unknown in many countries in the world and so also in Border we are kind of trying to find out how to tackle this issue. And I was wondering how, um, how, how much confidence you have in this tool to um, extrapolate or to use it in other contexts, in other, in other countries, for example. Yes. I mean, so far, it, I mean, the structure of the tool, of course, can be uh, easily used for other contexts, but the baseline data used in the tool is specific to the Nile Delta. However, as the tool is really like fully transparent, you have all the parameters, you have the source of the parameters, so you will see which parameter is context specific and which one is not. So basically it means that now, you know, if we sit together and we understand the tool, you can see exactly which kind of research should be done in a specific context to be able to adapt the tool. Maybe have a, an upper suit to the project. So this was funded by SECO. This is KFW of Switzerland. Um, I think they were happy with the project outcomes, but since then have left the sector in Egypt because of the frustrations that uh, Philippe was, was mentioning and just not enough things moving after five years of interventions. So SECO is no longer now working in, in the <coughs> wastewater sector. One question from my side, this conclusion, they are fed in into SECO and uh, being applied or used in other contexts as in other projects? I mean, you're right, we, we just finalized in, uh, in May, so I would say it's too early to say it. Now we are kind of doing the follow-up in Egypt. I mean, as you know, like Egypt has, has had like a, a life like this for the past five years now. I mean, the situation is settled since one year, so we are like kind of an increase of stability again and new work at policy level and uh, like a new strive in rural sanitation. So I would say how it is taken up, we'll see that, I guess, in the next year. So we continue following up with uh, the partners there.